Well, look, Peter, when the president walked into this administration, there was an economic crisis, there was a COVID crisis, there was a climate change crisis, and we're still dealing uh, with a lot of that right now, but the president turned the economy back on. If things are going so great, though, then why is it the White House officials are trying to redefine recession? No, we're not redefining recession. If we all understand a recession to be two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth in a row, and then you have White House officials come up here to say, no, 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 that's not what a recession is. It's something else. How is that not redefining recession? Because that's not the definition. That is not the definition. You know perfectly well what is the matter with you, Winston. You've known it for years, though you've fought against the knowledge. You are mentally deranged. You suffer from a defective memory. You never tried to cure yourself of it because you did not choose to. It was a small effort of will which you are not ready to make. We have seen the definitions of many words change over the past few years for political and ideological reasons, and some have even been lost altogether. Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N not in okay. this context. So I'm you not a biologist. The meaning of the word woman. Is Why do you ask that question? I just really like to know. What do you think the answer to that question is? We can now add recession to the list. In an opinion piece for the Wall Street Journal, Phil Magnus, research and education director at AIER, aptly points out that an economic downturn is a political problem, so the White House is playing semantics by redefining the term. Rather than tackling the underlying economic problems, the White House is playing word games. Economists have long defined a recession as a period in which real GDP declines for at least two consecutive quarters. To quote the popular economics textbook by Nobel laureates Paul Samuelson and William Nordhaus. This definition isn't perfect, but it describes almost every downturn since World War II. With expectations of low or even negative growth for the first two quarters of 2022, President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors has been trying to blunt the news by disavowing this textbook definition. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've gotten into a technical discussion about uh, what constitutes a recession. And I think, look, bringing the facts to the table is something that we as economic advisors have to do. It is neither the official definition nor the way economists evaluate the state of the business cycle, reads a post on the White House website. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen endorsed the claim on NBC over the weekend. Even if that number is negative, we are not in a recession now. And um, I, I would, you know, warn that we should be um, not, not characterizing that as a recession. In place of the standard economic definition of a recession, administration officials point to the Business Cycle Dating Committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research as the official recession scorekeeper. It's a highly convenient move for them. While the nonpartisan NBER employs a robust set of indicators to pinpoint recessions, it does so retrospectively. The Great Recession of 2007-2009, for example, had already been underway for a year before the NBER released its determination. The signs were everywhere, but now it's official we are in a recession. The research group that makes that determination made it today and said the recession actually started a year ago. But the question now, when will it end? Sometimes recessions end by the time NBER classifies them, and this built-in delay limits the utility of NBER scorekeeping for real-time policy decisions. The White House's attempt to wordsmith its way around a recession shows the dangers of politicizing economic terms. Mr. Biden's economic advisors are trying to buy time by exploiting NBER's otherwise defensible methodology. They hope doing so will insulate the administration from the electoral backlash in the event of a downturn. There is no federal statute that appoints the NBER as the official arbiter of recessions. Quite the contrary, the federal government has historically followed the conventional textbook definition. But this rationale works against the White House's current argument, which seeks to delay acknowledging a recession even if a two-quarter decline is observed this year. The president's economic team should think twice before discounting the risk of a recession. After all, they stumbled into the current inflationary crisis after a year of trying to manipulate the language. Inflation was transitory and therefore of little concern 
until it eventually topped an annualized 9%. Is there a risk of inflation? Um, I, I think there's a small risk, and I think it's manageable. I don't anticipate that inflation is going to be a problem, but it is something that we're watching very carefully. Was it a mistake, Madam Secretary, to downplay this inflation risk? Did that contribute to the problems we're all seeing right now? Let's not stumble into a recession because the White House has political priorities that conflict with economic reality. If you attempt to post your own opinion about the White House attempting to change the definition of a recession on Facebook, Beware of the arbiters of reality. Hey everybody, it's Angie from PolitiFact, and we get this question a lot. What is PolitiFact's agenda? Well, our agenda is simple. Who will flag your post for misinformation, stating, no, the White House didn't change the definition of recession. Phil Magnus fact-checked the fact-checkers on Twitter, stating, Remember that time in 2019 when Senator Warren made an unsubstantiated claim that we were in a manufacturing recession and PolitiFact rated it half true? Today, they're giving a false rating to posts that challenge White House spin about definition of recession. Guess what definition of a recession PolitiFact used at the time to make its determination? The same one they now rate as false, two consecutive quarters. He goes further, tweeting, the entire media fact-checking industry is an exercise in politically motivated fraud. So the PolitiFact agenda is work hard to find the facts. We want to help people understand the issues of the day by reading our fact-checking reports. So we look for data, we consult experts, we search high and low for the most credible, authoritative information. Librarians are our friends. The PolitiFact agenda is, don't take sides with any politician or party. We're independent and we work hard to find the truth. In a post-truth era, the meanings of words are arbitrarily changed to suit the prevailing narrative with fact-checkers at the ready to enforce the ever-changing so-called truths of the anointed. In his book, The Vision of the Anointed, Thomas Sowell succinctly states, What does the vision offer that reality does not offer? What a vision may offer, and what the prevailing vision of our time emphatically does offer, is a special state of grace for those who believe in it. Those who accept this vision are deemed to be not merely factually correct, but morally on a higher plane. Put differently, those who disagree with the prevailing vision are seen as being not merely in error, but in sin. For those who have this vision of the world, the anointed and the benighted do not argue on the same moral plane or play by the same cold rules of logic and evidence. The vision of the anointed. Now that's, a, that's an interesting title. Who are the anointed? They are the elite in the media, in, the, in politics. All of those who think that third parties ought to be making people's decisions for them. The subtitle is self-congratulation as a basis for social policy. In other words, people who think that everything that's wrong with the, the country is due to the fact that other people are just not as smart as they are. And if only they could, you know, or people like them could take over and make our decisions, we'd be so much better off. There has been a real shift towards ESG uh, over the past several years. And whether that idea needs to be suspended to some degree relative to what's happening now and the national security issues that it is either creating or has created? I, I don't think that the ESG movement and the emphasis on climate change is creating the problems that we have. If anything, the problem is that we haven't moved as rapidly as we should have. And so um, would I say there will never ever be another financial crisis, you know? Probably that would be going too far, but um, I do think we're much safer, and I hope that it will um, not be in our lifetimes, and I don't believe it will be. If the technical definition is two quarters of contraction, you're saying that's not a recession? That's not the tech. No? That's not the technical definition. I, I will be, would be amazed if the NBER would declare this period to be a recession, right. even if it happens to have two quarters of negative growth. Or, as George Orwell simply wrote, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. Only the disciplined mind can see reality, Winston. It needs an act of self-destruction an effort of the will. Do you remember writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say two plus two equals four? Yes. Huh. 
How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says there are not four, but five, then how many? Five. Right, Winston. Reality is in the human mind, not in the individual mind, which makes mistakes and soon perishes. But in the mind of the party, that doesn't sound like a recession to me. Thank you very much. How confident are you that we're not heading towards a big recession? How can I help you? How can I help what I see around in my eyes? Two and two makes four. Sometimes, Winston. Sometimes they're five. Sometimes they're three. Sometimes they're all of them at once.